Today on America's Test Kitchen, Dan makes Bridget perfect for Kevin. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of ricotta. Lisa reveals her top pick for wine coolers. And Aaron makes Julia the ultimate Parmesan Ferrotto. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. In Italy, porchetta is serious business. Roadside stores rub boneless whole hogs with fennel, garlic, and herbs. Then they spit roast the pigs until the meat is juicy and the skin is hard and crackly. Now, it is so good that a porchetta sandwich is literally nothing more than meat on a white roll. But we are not in Italy, and we're not going to ask you to cook a whole pig. So Dan is here, and he's going to show us a great version of porchetta that you and I can make at home. So Bridget, this is our pig right here. <laughs> it shrunk. It shrunk a little bit. <laughs> tiny little pig. American pigs are tiny now. <laughs> so we're actually going to turn porchetta, which is a great street side food, into a really nice roast. And for that, we decided to shrink it down and we're gonna use a boneless pork butt. Mm. Same thing we use for barbecue, it's gonna get meltingly tender, but we have to wait on that a second. All right. First, we gotta deal with the flavor, and porchetta has a very distinctive flavor profile. So we have three tablespoons of fennel seed. We're gonna use our coffee grinder here. We don't use coffee in it, so it doesn't taste like coffee, <laughs> but it's gonna grind to a nice fine powder. So we've got a lot of fennel in there. It's gonna really come through in the meat, which is great. So the next ingredient is a half a cup of rosemary. So this is fresh rosemary, it's about two bunches. Next, a quarter cup of fresh thyme. We also have 12 cloves of garlic, a tablespoon of black pepper, and two teaspoons of kosher salt. I'm just gonna pulse this until it's broken down a little bit. Okay, so that looks good, smells oh, good. Smells amazing. Now you needed to pre-grind the fennel because it would have never ground down enough with all the other ingredients in the food processor. Next up, we have a half cup of extra virgin olive oil. I'm gonna process this until it gets nice and smooth. Oh. Okay, that looks and smells really good. So we have our nice six pound boneless pork butt here, nice fat cap on top. We don't have skin in this case to get nice and crackly and give us that nice comparison to the mm. tender meat, but the fat, if we treat it right, it'll do the same thing for okay. us. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is use my chef's knife and cross hatch it. It's spaced one inch apart. So it's gonna allow some of the fat to render, it's gonna get really crispy, and I'm gonna go in both directions. I'm gonna go down through the fat, but not into the meat. So I've got a nice cross hatch on this, and what I'm gonna do is actually split this into two roasts, okay. which we find cook better, it's a lot nicer for slicing too. So I'm gonna find the grain, and we wanna cut with the grain, because eventually we're gonna carve against, against the grain. We're gonna use a boning knife, you can do this with a paring knife, and make some really deep slits into mm. this meat here where we can get all that seasoning in. We're gonna go all the way through there. I'm gonna start like this, and then I kinda of tilt it out so I can make sure I get all the way through on that side. Set that one aside, we're gonna do the same thing over here. Okay, so now we're gonna start seasoning. We've got all these places for that to go. So we're gonna take them, put them fat side down. I'm gonna season all sides of the meat except the fat cap with a couple teaspoons of kosher salt. Now Dan looks like a super fancy chef because he's holding his hand way up high as he's seasoning the roast. But that's actually a really good idea because you get a more even disbursement of the salt the higher up you go. So now it's time to get into our paste. This is where it gets really messy, but also really fun. So we're gonna take it and put it all over and also really get into here. So I worked some of that salt into the sides here, but we're really gonna get the paste in there. Really work it inside all of these nice slits we made. I'm going to tie these up with three pieces of twine on each one, so they kind of hold their shape a little bit better, and they're gonna cook for a long period of time, be very tender, we want them to hold together. Okay. So we're gonna turn these fat side up. I like to start in the middle. So as Dan ties these knots, he's actually making that first loop twice right around the string, and that way it's going to hold itself in place, and you don't need another person's finger to hold it in place while you make a double knot. Works for Christmas presents, and it works for pork. Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about pork shoulder. A whole pork shoulder weighs in around 18 pounds, and that runs from the top of the front shoulder all the way down to the trotter. Now, the pork butt or Boston butt is the top part of the shoulder. The cut is comprised of several muscles and it can be poorly butchered when the bone is removed. So it's best to purchase a pork butt that's not in any netting or under plastic wrap. And that way you can see that the entire cut is intact. The final thing our pork needs before it goes into the fridge is a nice coating on the fat that's gonna help it crisp and brown. And so for that, we're gonna use a tablespoon of kosher salt, a teaspoon of ground black pepper, and one of our favorite ingredients, a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda. Now baking soda raises the pH on the surface here, and when it's more alkaline, it's gonna brown better. So we're just gonna mix this up and season away. 
Okay, so I have a nice sprinkling on here. I'm gonna use my fingers to rub it in, try and get it in those crevices that we created with the crosshatch. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna transfer these to our wire rack, set in a rim baking sheet. And these are gonna go into the fridge uncovered. We're gonna leave them there for at least six hours and up to 24 hours. They're gonna dry on the surface a little bit. It's gonna help them brown in the oven. Great. So 24 hours has passed and we've allowed a lot of that salt and seasoning to get inside the meat. So now it's time to roast it. When we played around with this recipe and did a lot of testing, we wanted to figure out how to get it really, really juicy. We know that low and slow from barbecue is really good, right? We get super tender meat, so we wanted to do that here. The problem is if you go really low, about a 250 degree oven, it takes about six hours. A little too long for pork head, a in little my too. book, yes. So the part of the reason that it takes so long is when you get to about 150, 160 degrees, we get evaporative cooling and it cools the meat so much that it can just kind of stall at that temperature for a long period of time. So in barbecue world, they solve that by wrapping the meat in foil. It prevents that evaporative cooling and allows you to get right through that temperature. So what we're gonna actually do is transfer this to a roasting pan. We're gonna cover it with foil. So this way we can go into a 325 degree oven, which is relatively hot, but it's gonna trap moisture in here so it's not gonna go over 212 degrees, and that moisture in there is gonna allow it to go past that stall and cook pretty quickly. So it's been two and a half hours. We're gonna take it out and temp it. Okay. If you wouldn't mind turning the oven up to 500 degrees. So let's take the temp here. Now we're looking for, at this point, 180 degrees. And you got it. And I got it, nice, that looks great. So we get really fast cooking in this nice moist environment, but as you can see, we don't get a lot of browning. Nope. So we're gonna solve that problem. What I'm gonna do is transfer these off to this plate here. So this is really flavorful liquid. We're not gonna use it in this recipe, but it's like instant soup. It's good to keep. So next we're gonna line it with foil here. So just this little layer of foil right here will help any of the fat that renders out from smoking in that really hot oven. Okay. So before we put them back in, I'm actually gonna take off the twine. It's for good reason. So once we get this nice and crispy, you can easily pull that fat off. We want that to stay on there. Okay, so now they go right back in. And fat cap side up, right? That, oh yeah, we gotta get that fat nice and crispy. So we want that up. So once our oven is at 500 degrees, we're gonna put the pork back in and we're gonna cook it for 20 to 30 minutes until it hits 190. It's gonna be beautifully crisp on the outside. I cannot wait. Oh. Ooh, that was good, right? You delivered on your promise, that's for sure. Oh, just look at that. It's still sizzling. We're it's still getting crispier fat. So I'm gonna transfer these to our carving board over here. Ooh. And those are gonna need to rest for 20 minutes before we slice into them. So this is nice and tender, but we still wanna cut across the grain, just as we would with any roast. It's gonna make it even more tender. So I'm gonna cut some nice, thick, kind of half-inch slices. But man, this knife just goes through like butter. This is so tender. Look at how juicy that is. Oh, that's just beautiful. Incredible. Yeah, this isn't the type of roast that you can really cut into very thin deli slices. Give you a couple pieces here. Thank you. Is that rosemary and the fennel and the garlic? Mm. Mm. I'm excited about this. Mm. Having a moment. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it's all about. So it's not quite as tender as, say, something like a pork shoulder that you would make for pulled pork. You want that almost to be overcooked, but it still melts in your mouth. Oh, yeah. Every single bite has the garlic, the fennel, salt and pepper. I would put this on a roll and just eat this. Yes. No condiments needed. We, didn't, we don't need a sauce with it. No. It's got that much flavor. So for our easy porchetta, score the fat on a pork shoulder, rub with a flavorful fennel paste, and then cut and tie into two pieces. Cook the roast in a moderate oven, then finish at 500 degrees to crisp the top. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, an easy, tasty, amazing home version of porchetta. Ice buckets for keeping wine cool are a mess. They're drippy and they even overchill your wine. We tested six innovative wine coolers that use no ice. They range in price from $14 to $55. We chilled two dozen bottles of wine to the same temperature and started testing, both with full bottles of wine and ones where we periodically poured off a glass, all the while tracking the temperatures. Now some of these were terrible. This one by RSVP, it's made of marble and it's heavy and you have to shove this whole thing in your freezer and then throw in a cup of water before you put in the wine. That's super inconvenient and it's still messy. 
This one by Wine Enthusiast has a double wall insulation, like a thermos. It's supposed to keep the wine cool without ice, but it barely did better than leaving the bottle out on the counter. This one's our winner. You slide in these little freezer packs, the insert, stick in your wine, and you're done. It's nice and compact, and it doesn't drip. And it kept wine within 10 degrees of its starting temperature for more than seven full hours. And best of all, it's not expensive. For just over $20, the OG stainless steel wine cooler with freezer inserts is the way to stay chill. Ricotta is a very mild tasting cheese, which begs the question, does brand really matter? It does matter, Julia. So we've got four brands here. They should be sweet. So some of them really didn't have that sweetness that we wanted. Texture is really a big issue. It should be velvety, luscious. It should not be like cottage cheese. <laughs> okay. All right, so you can Gave start Give me some hints in. there, I guess. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about how ricotta is made. So these are all whole milk. You can buy either part skim or whole milk ricotta. We much prefer the whole milk, and so we're only tasting whole milk today. It bakes up better. You know, we did this as you're doing it now. We also did it in manicotte. Ricotta comes from the Italian word that means recooked. Um, so you're like, recooked? Mm. Uh, so when you make cheese, you separate the curds from the whey. Now, the Italians, they never throw out anything. Ricotta is made from the whey, which usually you would just, uh, you know, throw down the, the drain. So they recook that whey and get more proteins and lactose, the natural sugars in the milk, to become this beautiful, velvety, plush curd that is called ricotta. So interestingly, these are all domestic. They're all supermarket national brands. <laughs> your, 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 your eyes <laughs> are telling you. One is not like the others. <laughs> yes, one is not like the others. What did you just taste there that was different? It had a texture like cottage cheese. I mean, it wasn't smooth or creamy at all. It was, seemed like a different animal. And we found that if it tasted that way in this tasting, when we then cooked with it, it was the same problem. So you got a sort of filling inside the matacani that was really not that pleasant. We found that the two that we liked the best were actually made with whey, along with a little bit of milk. The other two in the sample were just made with milk. So the uh, Americans taking shortcuts, you know, not following the classic Italian recipe, which often gets us into trouble when we take old fashioned, centuries old recipes and then modify them. The texture issue was really interesting. We did a lot of research, we talked to university scientists and they said in Italy, when they make ricotta, they actually hand scoop out the cheese. It's because the curds are so delicate that if you have them beaten up in a machine, they can turn curdy on you and get kind of all broken and separated. Now, of course, a supermarket product, they're not gonna have somebody sitting there with a scoop doing this <laughs> by hand, but our winner actually has invented a gentle pump system. So rather than having it mechanically separated, it gently pumps out the ricotta so that the curds stay creamy and delicate and not broken. Mm. So you've been tasting these. I have been. I know the one at the end you're not wild about. Nope, that's a non-starter for me because okay. of the texture. This one, I didn't like either. It really had an off flavor, a little bit bitter. Almost wondered if it wasn't going bad. I mean, okay. it was just a little bit, yeah, not so sweet. These two were my favorites. This one was particularly sweet. It made me almost think there was sugar in it. This one had a very smooth, creamy texture. So between these two, I'm kind of split. I think I'd go for the less sweet but creamier texture of this one. So this one's my favorite, close second. All right, let's see how you did, Julia. All right. You have chosen the winner, the Bel Gioioso, made here in the USA. It's really creamy, mm. luscious, velvety. Velvety is a good yeah. word for and, it. And it has a little bit of sweetness to it that's natural to the milk, but you can really taste the whey, and it's delicious. It is delicious. All right, so this one, which was very sweet. That's our runner-up. Ah. Well, you're doing really well today. <laughs> this is the Galbani. Again, this has also got the whey made the traditional Way, w -A -Y, <laughs> W-A-Y, not W-H-E-Y, that they would produce the ricotta in Italy. All right, and this one, which was a little bit sour to me. So this is Calabro. This was in third place. It was an okay choice, but it wasn't as delicious as the top two. Yeah, very clear differences here. And this one, which I did not like at all. Organic Valley, the bottom of the rankings, the texture's all wrong. It's cottage cheese. It is not ricotta. So when it comes to making ricotta, it's all about the way. And for our money, we like Bel Gioioso Ricotta for $3.99.
don't need rice to make risotto. In fact, I've had risottos made with barley, oats, even cauliflower. But today, Erin's going to show us how to make farotto, which is risotto made with farro, an ancient form of wheat that's been grown in Italy for centuries. Absolutely, Julia. As you know, with risotto, it's creamy and rich and it's just so amazing, but it's not as simple as just substituting farro in for arborio rice. We did a lot of testing and I'm going to show you what we learned. All right. Okay. As with the risotto, we're going to heat our liquid. So we're going to use three cups of water and three cups of chicken broth. We tried it with all chicken broth, but it just dominated the farro flavor. We really wanted too that chicken natural. It was too chickeny, exactly. We wanted the farro flavor to come through. So we're gonna heat it up over high heat. And once it comes to a boil, I'm gonna cut it back and put a lid on it. While our broth is coming up to temperature, I'm just gonna finally chop a half an onion. Anytime you cut an onion, Julia, you always wanna cut through the root end to split it. Right, because that root end holds all the layers together so they don't split apart while you're chopping. Absolutely. First, I'm gonna make several horizontal cuts. I'm just gonna keep my hand on top of the onion and I'm just gonna slide the knife through. I'm not gonna cut all the way through. And then I turn it and I make several vertical cuts. I'm just gonna turn it and cut crosswise. I'm just gonna finish mincing this onion and we're gonna wait for our stock to come up to a simmer and then we can continue. We're gonna move over to our farro. So we are gonna use one and a half cups of whole grain farro, so it has the outer hull, and that's where all the flavor is. That's where the challenge comes in because it locks in all that starch that we need to come out to actually make our farotto creamy. We tried a bunch of different recipes and a lot of recipes came out very thin and very lackluster. There was one recipe that actually called for soaking it overnight and then processing it in the food processor. And that really broke up and cracked the grains and it allowed the starches to come out, which is perfect. So that was great, but we did not want the overnight soak. So somebody suggested using a blender, which is what we're gonna use. Okay, so I'm gonna pulse this six times. And the blender is shaped like a funnel and it creates a vortex. So all these grains had no choice but to meet the blade. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, Julia, we have some whole grains and we also have some cracked grains. So we're shooting for about half of the grains to be cracked and that's just enough grain so that starches are gonna thicken our farotto. Very okay. clever. So shopping for farro can be very confusing. To start, there are three varieties of farro. It can be made from icorn, emmer, or spelt, although most of the farro sold in this country is from icorn wheat. The other thing that can be confusing is that it's processed to different levels. For farotto, we're gonna use whole farro. That means the hull is still intact. But very often, you can find pearled farro. That means some of that hull has been removed. And if you're lucky, it says so on the label. But putting pearl on the label doesn't always happen. Take this, for example. This has been pearled, but you'll see it doesn't say anywhere on the label. It also doesn't say it in the ingredient list. But you notice it does say cooks in 10 minutes. Now, that's very fast for farro, because a whole farro takes about 30 to 40 minutes. So when shopping for farro for farotto, look for whole farro. And if you don't see whole on the label, look at the cooking time. It should be 30 minutes or longer. OK, Julie, we're going to start our farotto. So we have two tablespoons of butter melting. And I'm going to add our chopped half onion. I'm going to cook this just for about three to four minutes until the onion softens. Our onions are nice and soft, Julia. Now I'm going to add one clove of garlic. And we're just going to stir this up so you can smell it. I can already smell oh, it. Oh, yeah. Can you smell that? It smells good. Next, we're going to add our cracked farro. I'm going to toast this, Julia, for about three to four minutes until I can start smelling it becoming nice and toasty. And this is really developing the farro flavor. We do this often when we make regular risotto, but also when we make pilaf or quinoa or almost any grain, toasting it deepens the flavor. All right, so there we are. Can you just got a little darker in color, and can you yeah. smell that? I can totally smell yeah. it. It's ready. OK, so we're going to move back to our broth mixture. What we're going to do is we're just going to take the lazy man's approach. We're going to add five cups. Speaking my language, yep. lazy man's approach. This is a lot more liquid than a traditional risotto method, where you just add it in small batches. You added almost all the liquid. There's only one cup left over there, which we'll use later on. We're just going to let this simmer. All the bubbles are going to make the farro agitate, and all the starch molecules are going to come out, and it's going to be just as creamy as if you stirred it for 25 minutes. We're also going to put a lid on it. You never put a lid on risotto because you're stirring it the entire time, but we're going to put a lid on this. We're going to cook this for about 25 minutes over low heat until the farro is just al dente and the liquid is almost all absorbed. So let's take a closer look at what's happening in this pot. Starch granules in farro contain two different types of starch molecules called amylose and amylopectin. And they behave very differently in hot liquids. Let's take a closer look. Amylose molecules are long single chains. When these chains are heated, they break out of the farro starch granules as the granules break down during cooking. This leads to a soft, creamy texture. Amylopectin molecules are much more complex. 
Because of their branched structure, the amylopectin starches don't break out of the granules when they're cooked and don't absorb liquid very well. This leads to chewiness. Thanks to these two different starch molecules, our farota will have a creamy and chewy texture. Okay, Julie, it's been 25 minutes. I've stirred this a couple of times just to make sure it's all evenly distributed. And look, almost all that liquid has been absorbed and it should be about just al dente. So it should have a, still have a very good chew. It's starting to take on that creaminess. Okay, so now we're gonna add two teaspoons of chopped thyme, three quarters of a teaspoon of black pepper, and one teaspoon of salt. I'm just gonna stir it for about five minutes constantly. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna coax out more starch and it's gonna make our farotto even creamier. All right, Julia. Ooh, that's does that starting look, to look like risotto. Does that look creamy or what? Okay, I'm just turning off the heat. Now I'm gonna add two ounces of grated Parmesan cheese, which Ooh. is traditional in risotto. Two tablespoons of chopped fresh parsley. Two teaspoons of lemon juice. The lemon juice will really add a little brightness to it and cut through that richness. Two more tablespoons of butter. Just I see how you're doing. A little bit more cream. A little bit of butter, a little bit of cheese. Yep. And I'm just gonna stir this until the butter melts. Can you smell it? Doesn't mm. that smell so good? I can smell the Parmesan yep. and I can smell a little bit of lemon juice and that thyme. I'm gonna add a splash of our liquid just to kind of like loosen up a little bit because as it sits on our bowls, it's gonna tighten up even more. So I'm just gonna add a little bit more. That is the tricky thing about risotto and it's yep. also true of farotto, that as it sits, it really gets quite thick. So if it's sitting for a while before you serve it, yep. good idea to loosen it up with the rest of that liquid. And then it'll be perfect when you eat it. Now it's nice and fluid. I'm just gonna taste it for seasoning. Anytime you make anything, Julie, you wanna just taste it for seasoning. Might need a little pepper, a little salt, or it might be perfectly fine. I know, I love this, Julia. It's so good. <laughs> All right, I have my bowl ready. That looks delicious. Oh my God. Look at how creamy that yeah. is. Yeah. This is what we wanted. Mmm. It's like the ultimate comfort food. Yeah. So it has a little bit more complexity than um, risotto because mm -hmm. it has uh, the bran and the hull. This not only has the chew, but it has some flavor, that weedy flavor. Yep. What a difference. To give farotto a try, grind whole farro in the blender, then toast it in the pot before adding the hot liquid. Let it simmer until nearly tender, then stir constantly for the final five minutes of cooking. Finish with fresh herbs, parmesan, and lemon juice, and there you have it. From Artes Kitchen to your kitchen, a terrific new recipe for Parmesan Farotto. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. Mm. So good. So good. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.